everybody. I'm Brooke Masters, the Chief Business Commentator at the Financial Times, and welcome to our panel on the evolution of the Chief Financial Officer. We're presenting it in partnership with WNS. So here's their CFO, Christian Ragnathan, to welcome you. I just, thank you. Thank you, Brooke. And let me start off by saying a very warm welcome to everyone who has joined. Thank you for your time and participation. My name is Krishnan, as Brooke mentioned. I'm part of WNS, a leading business process management organization. And I lead our finance and accounting services uh, for our customers. And, uh, and, and as uh, part of that, uh, we work, you know, across multiple activities in terms of uh, you know delivering transformation change services which is what keeps me very close to this topic evolution of the cfo i've been involved with this for last several years through various research and various activities and that's why personally i'm very excited uh, in my role uh, on a regular basis i do interact with uh, more than 100 cfos uh, in our you know, customers that I work very closely with. And over the years, some of the things that have really stood out uh, to us is uh, the quantum of change in the industry is at an all-time high, be it related to digital technology changes, be it product changes, be it sourcing model changes, or, or be it just the stakeholder dynamics, dealing with Gen Z as customers or as talent that they work with, or, or, you know, uh, the millennials' expectations on how they engage with businesses. And the other important aspect is the pace of change is also at an all-time high. Keeping these things in mind, one thing that does stand out is speed of decision-making, expectation around that, and there are lots of decisions to make, I'm sure all of us know already, uh, is, is accelerated, is, is expected to be very fast. Uh, quality of decisions are important because failure could be sometimes catastrophic. I know pandemic is the more recent event, so we relate to that a lot. But probably pandemic was not just the first event that had a significant impact on business dynamics or industry dynamics, and it's not going to be the last one. So how these changes and these, these change, uh, the, the changes in the business environment are impacting the role of CFO is an area we continue to work very closely on, we remain very excited with, and we are always eager to learn from the best practices that we can learn from our fellow colleagues. And on that note, I would also like to welcome my colleagues on the panel today who Brooke will introduce shortly. Uh, and thank you for joining me uh, today and, and you know being part of this discussion. And with that, I'll close by once again welcoming you all, uh, thanking you for your participation, and hand it back to Brooke. panel is is going to give us a chance to hear from four different people in from very different sectors with very different perspectives but all of them share one thing we've all seen the role that our roles change because of the pandemic and i thought that would be a good way to start talking about the role of the cfo we've got this fabulous panel there's chris feeney from delaware north ann melman from crocs and prashant mahendra raja of analog devices Please remember that if you have questions, we want to hear from you. Please put them in the chat box to the side. Don't wait for the end. I'll try and work them in. Um, so let's let's take a, a why don't we go to Anne? Anne, tell us how has did COVID affect your role as CFO? Yeah, hi. Um, nice to, to be here. And um, I am the CFO of Crocs, so we make uh, comfortable, lightweight, colorful shoes. You can see my background. Um, so I think you know from the pandemic's um, standpoint, I think it's just accelerated a lot of a lot of things. And I um, agree with you know kind of the original introduction that things have just sped up. And so the pandemic has only um, kind of accelerated that because of digital transformation, because it has accelerated even more the move to digital, the um, ability to be flexible because we've all of a sudden had to adjust to working from home, as well as. Um, you know, just responding to the needs of the business, which have changed every single day. And you're trying to kind of suss out what's happening in a very difficult um, environment without a lot of, you know, time to 
um, analyze data. So I think the role of the CFO has changed mostly in the fact that it's sped up the ability um, of the of decision making and sped up the need for the CFO to really help the organization use the data they have to make the de best decisions they can um, in an uncertain environment. Uh, Prashant, do you want to jump in and tell us how your what how you see the pandemic has changed the role of the job? You're on, I think. Yes, thank you, thank you, uh, Brooke, and uh, good morning and good afternoon to everyone for joining. So, uh, yes, uh, my name is Prashant. I'm the the uh, chief financial officer for Analog Devices. Very quickly. We are a semiconductor company, about a little over nine billion in revenue and market cap just under 90 billion. I would say we're we're innovators at the core. We spend about 20% of our sales on R&D and we're focused really on the industrial, automotive, automotive communications and consumer markets. Uh, we are really passionate about our mission to engineer good, which means that we like the use of our technology in how it makes a positive impact on the world around us. When I think back about the events of 2020 and how they created such a great deal of uncertainty, as Anne mentioned, but also introduced new priorities for leadership teams in areas such as social justice, geopolitics, government affairs, uh, the, you know, the real acceleration of interest in ESG, shareholder activism, and so forth. I think that, uh, that the role of the CFO has evolved or has maybe the acceleration of the role of the CFO as being a co-pilot to the CEO and helping to take on more of the load that CEOs in today's publicly traded companies are responsible for is perhaps one of the biggest pivots I've seen from, uh, from the uh, pandemic that we just went through. Chris, do you agree? Have you ended up taking up more things that your CEO might have dealt with in the past? How has your role changed? Uh, I agree with both Anne and uh, previous speakers' comments that uh, the combination of the pace of change as well as a broadening of the CFO's responsibilities. Um, I'm Chris Feeney. I'm a CFO of a 105-year-old global hospitality provider, and I think the thing we realized about the company uh, during the pandemic is that we successfully diversified our uh, our exposure uh, from all things except uh, the need and ability of people to congregate. Uh, the pace of change uh, and the amount of scenario planning, alternate scenario planning, and kind of leading those discussions and choosing a way forward together and making informed uh, consensus-based decisions uh, required an enormous amount of work out of the CFO's office and, and our team. But I don't think uh, there was a moment ever where finance looked finer, but it probably required more and more different in a, a very rapidly changing environment with more uncertainty than we've ever dealt with before. We've already got a question from the audience and it's a really good one, which is, we all talked about pace of change accelerating. But has remote work changed the decision-making process, even slowed it down? Because you can't just like stick your head in the, in the, in the next room and get questions. What do you guys think? Has it slowed down? Uh, Christian, you got a view? Uh, it depends. Uh, it has, in general, not slowed down. Uh, see, I I'll tell you, one of the things that pandemic has taught us to be is to be more nimble. I would say the single largest common factor of success for any organization is the agility. And going by that, uh, people who have adapted to that very quickly, I think so for them, it was not slowing down. If at all, the speed of decision making uh, improved because you know they were more agile in, in terms of response post the experience. For some, there was a lot of postponement of decisions. So uh, our experience was kind of hybrid. Uh, but overall, I would say it, it, it actually improved and agility has increased. Interesting. I, I can see that Prashant wants to talk about how M&A has been affected. So uh, we, um, we had a pretty interesting experience during the pandemic that I think uh, is, is worth sharing as it relates to decision making and the, and the question that was asked. Uh, we uh, we conducted a very large transaction, about a 21 ended up being 27 billion dollar uh, transaction after after the markets uh, rose over the past year, to acquire a, a company in California, and the entire uh, deal was done virtual. 
it was the first transaction actually in the in uh, in the space last year that was done completely virtually and our experience is that decision making actually accelerated because you could get people together faster and the challenge of working through uh, scheduling logistics, flights, et cetera, normal meetings that would require you to either visit customers, suppliers, or partners became, uh, became virtual. And we found that we could reach uh, many key decision makers uh, in our ecosystem uh, at, a, at a much faster pace. And, uh, and I think uh, uh, perhaps one of the downsides of, of the virtual work environment was people have been working longer hours. And because you, don't, you had really no place to go outside the house, uh, so you ended up working longer hours. So that also sort of accelerated decision making. There's a real interest in um, what kinds of new skills and capabilities you guys have had to develop. Links, I think, to very practical examples, like when you took something over from a CEO or something that you hadn't done it on, done before. Give us an example of what that is and what that required you to do differently. And you want to take it? Take this one first. I think um, I think the thinking about how we can um, accelerate data to manage our risk and also think through faster decision making. So I think helping the CEO, providing, making sure that we all have the same data um, to make decisions in really good, fast analysis. I think that was kind of the biggest thing. And somebody mentioned um, scenario planning as well. So kind of working through the scenarios, presenting them together, thinking through um, you know, the key inputs there and really understanding how those move and what drives that outcome and then how much risk we want to take on as a company when um, the future's a little bit uncertain. I think that's something that um, both, the, you know, I partner very closely with on the CFO or on the CEO side. And then also, you know, just making sure all of our stakeholders are informed, including, you know, our investors and doing really good, open, fast communication to investors, our board, all of the stakeholders, our employees, so that we're all on the same page and everybody's understanding where we're at. And I think um, that was a really important role of the CFO because so much of it was financial that you're talking about and risk that it makes sense for you to really lead point on a lot of that communication as a CFO. Chris, did you have a similar experience or different? Yeah, I'm just building on most particularly with the board. Um, and it's funny, we've almost transitioned back to a more normalized way of uh, reporting out to the board and to our investors and stakeholders. I've referred to the last 18 months as all finance all the time. And the point is that because of the disruptions uh, that our business occurred and the pivots we had to make, uh, finance really had to take a more a leadership role uh, working with all those external uh, participants as well as, you know, working very closely with internal messaging to all key stakeholders in a way that uh, was, while we participated before, never at the level uh, that we had because of the pandemic. Interesting. I think let's shift gears a little bit and think about uh, the world beyond COVID. Um, the other big transformational issue, of course, is digital. And most, all companies are having to cope with digitalization, which COVID obviously accelerated. But that's not a, um, that's not a one-off from the pandemic. Um, when you think about your roles, how do sort of digital advances, you know, r roughly described as you know, big data, artificial intelligence, machine learning, automation, how has that changed your role and how do you see it changing it in the near term? Um, who wants to jump in on this one? And we got a view. Anne's got a view and then we'll, we'll go around. Yeah. Um... So I, I think, you know, digital transformation, again, just speeds up the need to make decisions. It, it just speeds everything up, right? You're getting a ton of data in because you're connected in a way that you've never been before. But to be able, but you also, the pressure to make decisions is much faster than it ever has before. So to be able to analyze that, um, that information and that data and be able to get clear signals and then turn around and allow your organization to make quick decisions is really important. I would say that's also kind of an evolved role of the CFO. I think before it was, you know, the CFO's role was to slow things down and really make sure things are thoughtful and really make sure, you know, things aren't going to break the enterprise. I think now it's giving a decision framework um, in a way to have the, um, the business be able to quickly make decisions in a way that doesn't add additional risk. But if they, if we can't react quickly, then you can't evolve. And I, I think, you know, um, digital has really, really, 
um, changed that that speed. And I think just, you know, and also just the speed in which everything and all of our businesses are changing so quickly. So I think reacting to that is really important. And it's the CFO's job to really make sure the business is armed with the right information to make those quick decisions. I saw Krishna nodding and looking like he wanted to jump in. Do you want to say something? Sure, Rook. Yeah, I, I first of all, completely agree with them there. And uh, I would add to that, the other aspect on digital, you know, one of the things we are looking at is increasingly as cost reduction being one of the first priority of digital, it's becoming stakeholder experience. And, and that's an interesting shift. And one of the things we talk about is finance one office. Now the visibility of end-to-end -end customer journey or stakeholder journey is much higher and much faster given the use of technology. And therefore, there's a lot of focus on experience of the people with the whole process, right? So that's another interesting dynamic we've been watching. And alongside that comes to your point, uh, being able to monitor transactions uh, using big data, using analytics. And one of the terms we use is, we, we call it using data as fuel and not exhaust, which means instead of looking at data at the end of the process as an exhaust, you start using it upfront as fuel to modify and monitor the transactions. Prashant, did, did you want to say something? Three, three takeaways for me as I think about digital. Uh, the first is that it is highly disruptive and, and I would encourage folks in the, uh, in the audience to think about how this uh, this transformation can be disruptive to your industry in ways that you haven't thought about before. Uh, you know, in in our world, I think you know the the work that some of the automotive companies are now doing to build cars to order versus the the, the more traditional model of having uh, vehicles uh, in in lots waiting for buyers. I think about in the uh, you know even in the in the pharmaceutical industry now the ability to custom order the selection of pills that a particular uh, patient uses and have that come to you by mail versus the traditional distribution model of going through um, going through a pharmacy. So uh, a tremendous amount of disruption in business models and in supply chains that require everyone to be thoughtful about how, how it could impact your business and how it can disrupt your ecosystem. The, the second, uh, I would say, is uh, and a little bit of what the what the prior uh, folks talked about. There is such an abundance of data and such an abundance of information. Determining what is insight versus just noise becomes much more difficult in this world because now you have you have the ability to bring in volumes of information, but that can be and, and often is overwhelming if you don't have the right uh, process and tools to think about how to convert that into actionable insight. And then last, I would say, is understanding how the workforce thinks about digital. Uh, and I speak I, more specifically to digital natives and the how uh, um, a, a younger workforce who grew up in a very digital environment is expecting to interact with their employer and kind of with the, with the, um, with the broad uh, community at large and understanding what needs to change within your company to be receptive, to make it a more uh, a hospitable and a growth environment for them, uh, which is a big change when, when you know, many of the folks in more leadership positions saw the advent of the internet during their lifetime versus being born into it. Makes sense. Um, I think, Chris, you haven't got a chance to talk about digital and how that's affecting your role and your business. Sure, happy to add. Uh, I think in Anne and Prashana's comments were great, but just building on that, uh, really looking at the process around once you have new information sources, you're comfortable with the quality of the information sources, orienting people to use them and to really understand what the information is. Uh, that takes time, and as well as building that governance process around it and are uh, making sure uh, that uh, the users are taught and uh, socialized uh, to use it effectively. I, it's really spent, uh, it was more time than I anticipated, more resources than I anticipated. And uh, it's really helping uh, making sure that information is used appropriately. So that's really a big emphasis. 
Uh, this might be a good moment to sort of talk about another part of the digital question, which is security, cybersecurity, because obviously with everyone remote, that's been more of an issue and also with all the ransomware attacks. Give me a quick show of hands. Who's responsible for cybersecurity as one of your functions as the CFO? Are all one of the rest of you? Or do you have CTOs who do it too? So, so two yeses and two noes. Um, so I'd be interested in the two of you who are responsible for cybersecurity, um, how that has affected your role. And it was, is that new or has that always been true? Um, why don't you go first, Krishnan? Okay. So uh, I think so. The whole work from home environment was a completely different ballgame. It uh, accelerated the whole paperless environment mindset. Uh, for some of the businesses who thought they could never operate from home, they realized they can. Uh, so uh, the whole aspect of cybersecurity in terms of the infrastructure side of it, which is threat detection and continuous monitoring had to be stepped up. But not just that, access controls, moving data to cloud, uh, moving all access. So there are multiple tools available today that enable a lot of that security. Some of it was just learning process and some of it was enablement. The other aspect with cybersecurity, I think so it's important is we, we just focus on cybersecurity, but I try and call it digital security as well. The, as the reliance of this goes heavily on digital tools, the uptime of these tools sometimes is, is going to decide the success of the organization. I mean, you can't afford to have uh, your data center going down without a backup being live uh, in today's environment. And therefore, business continuity planning and, and you know continuity planning around the digital assets is an equally important aspect of that security. And finally, I would say regulations, uh, the Data Protection Acts, and the regulatory environment that has to be monitored, which can be different for Europe and different for you know, other countries, uh, that also has to be factored in. Uh, good part is uh, technology is staying ahead, so it is providing all of those options. You just need to make sure you are covering them. Makes sense. Um, Brooke, I won't. I won't uh, repeat some of the good points that uh, that Krishnan made. So maybe I'll focus specifically on uh, on um, state-sponsored uh, attacks and the threat of ransomware. Uh, I think that. Uh, it is very difficult for private enterprises to be able to defend themselves against the unlimited budget of state-sponsored attacks. And as a technology company where our core, our core um, asset really is our IP, uh, it is something that we, we put a lot of energy into as, as everyone in our, in our industry does. Uh, but in the end, it is very hard to, to fight against kind of the, the deep pockets of, of state actors. So, I would like to see more effort done by the regulatory authorities to increase the transparency of what is being spent on um, ransomware and cyber attacks so that it can be more apparent to investors and then also to regulatory authorities of what it is costing companies to, uh, to be able to defend themselves. And that may then um, create more momentum uh, at a at, at the federal levels uh, and in the in the right geopolitical environments to to try to contain state sponsored attacks because it's a it's a very unfair sort of David and Goliath uh, moment that we're all in right now. For sure, it it is very frustrating and, and difficult. Um, maybe we'll since not everyone's got to have this experience. Maybe we'll pivot now to. I'm sure all of you have had to think about technology tools with the actual finance function. Um, and I'd be interested in how all of that, the tools you're using are changing maybe for forecasting or budgeting or other you know, big data use there. Anybody got to want to share how that is changing your role? Christian's jumping in. Thank you, bro. So I think so. Uh, the you know one of the things I talk about is uh, in today's world, uh, how are you changing the finance analytics? We talk so much about speed of decision making. We talked about data as fuel. How do you enable that? And that's where I think so. Using technology uh, 
which has not been used before and using data models. Uh, so for example, we use forensic models like Benford law and other things uh, to do regular compliance monitoring and controls uh, and to identify exception transactions. Instead of doing the traditional value-based audits uh, or, or you know, percentage-based random audits, we try and do actual 100% transaction monitoring and use these technologies uh, to drive compliance. The other aspect is the whole area of predictive analytics and how predictive analytics is now able to use a lot more internal enterprise data because data is available now, but at the same time, a lot of external environment data, which is also available. And that could be your peers, your competition, and it could be industry at large and economies. So I think so leveraging uh, both of those aspects in terms of predictive models, also in terms of different tools like forensics to drive better compliances and controls, and all of this collectively for improved and faster decision making are some of the areas we are doing a lot of work and that's the change in my role. I think so the people I'm employing is, is not just accountants, but they're also statisticians and data scientists, which are becoming part of the team. Is that true for the rest of you? And do you want to jump in? Um, so, yeah, I totally agree with that. I, um, I think that what Christian just said is totally true. Um, I think there's a couple things and just also tying into what Chris said about data governance, because I think predictive analytics is one of the most important tools you have as a CFO, because you can, if you have the right data, you can feed that in and you can totally change the way you forecast. And you can really focus your finance team on, you know, kind of scenario analysis and inputs and drivers versus, you know, trying to figure out, you know, combining spreadsheets or trying to figure out a forecast. Um, but I think the cleanliness of your data really matters there. So having a really um, good, you know, data governance, which sounds um, easy, but it's, it's very, very difficult to make sure that you have all of the clean data that's being fed in, looking at external sources as well that are being fed in and really having the right people who can kind of think through that and put your governance structures in place really matters. And then I think also on pivoting as well, is it's totally true on the finance skill set you need for the future. So it's not just the tools that are changing, but obviously, you know, you need accountants, but you need people who can really understand tools and systems and, um, you know, data scientist skill sets, also people who are technically apt. And then you want to democratize your data so that you can really get it out there to, you know, different types of people who can really do the analysis. So it is a little bit of a pivot of a traditional finance function versus finance is much more, um, you need technology financial minded uh, staff to really help you kind of power, um, you know, the use of those of those new tools, so. Brooke, can I, can I ask uh, Anna a follow-up question on that? And I'd be curious your thoughts, because I, I, I completely agree with you. Is it, is it easier for us to take finance trained specialists and teach them data science and data and analytics or take data analytics and data science for folks and try to teach them a little bit more about debits and credits because the challenge is that today institutionally you get folks that are core in one or core in the other and and you're missing that domain expertise or the technical you know one way or the other yeah i think it's um I think it's mixed. I think you need both skill sets. So I think you need people who can really do kind of the data scientist work and kind of have a little bit, I mean, obviously the most valuable is the people who have technology and some finance background, um, but also that can automate that data and get it in the right way or do, you know, um, put that kind of science and understanding in the background and then democratize it so that you do have some of your traditional finance skill set that can still use that data and analyze it. So I think you need a good mix of both, um, which is, you know, obviously difficult because we're all living in a world of restrained resources, both on, you know, people we're able to hire as well as just, you know, dollar amounts that we want to invest in finance. But I think having a few key people in both functions are really important. I, I think it is hard to find one person, to your point, that has both skill sets. I can see that Chris is itching to jump in. I, I am, and thank you. Uh, but building on Anne, our approach was a little bit different. We actually uh, grabbed a couple talents from uh, an industry that was a little bit more advanced in analytics, then got them to partner 
with owners of data sets. Uh, and, you know, we've kind of created cross collaboration in addition. We've uh, sponsored, we're, start, we're, we're starting a program where we're sponsoring uh, employees, seasoned finance employees to go back and get uh, advanced degrees in, uh, in uh, predictive analytics and consumer behavior. So we've kind of come at it a slightly different way. Has anybody else tried that approach of retraining the people you've already got? Have, have not yet, and that's why I, I'm, I'm very uh, excited to hear from Chris later on on how it progresses, because I, I think, um, as Ann mentioned, the challenge is finding people of both skill sets is extremely hard, and frankly, they're, they're uh, uh, incredibly expensive because they are so rare. So you have to solve it one way or the other. You either have to, to teach domain expertise to data scientists, or you have to teach data science to, to finance professionals. We have a question from the audience, which actually I'm really interested in, too. We keep talking about how we need to use data as fuel and use it to predict and how it can you know, make us more efficient. Can you guys give real world examples of how that works in the finance area or in your job? Because I have to confess, I don't you know, I feel like it's buzzwords. Um, somebody, so each of you give me one example of something that some, some way you're using data in a predictive way that's improving how you do your job. Uh, we got the chance has an idea. Yeah, uh, the the easy one for me would be pricing. Uh, I we have uh, we have about one hundred and twenty five thousand customers, seventy five thousand SKUs. So you take the intersection of those two axes and you you generate our our nine billion dollars of revenue. It gives us a lot of opportunity to think about um, pricing at a very unique element. Uh, for each customer, for each SKU, for each location, and then to use um, use algorithms that allow us to think about what is the way to optimize that pricing, and and really make sure that it's it's consistent pricing across uh, across uh, th across the globe, normalizing it for different customer sizes, different geographies. Uh, you know, I think we have 20 or 30 different variables that we uh, that we uh, iterate around, and that would never be possible without today's computing power and the uh, the advancements that have been made in data science. That's fascinating. So, how does that play out in a shoe company, and or what do you guys use it for? Yeah. So, um, the easiest one for me to talk about is just revenue and demand planning. So, obviously, you know, we sell consumer products, so. You know, you can pipe in a number of different um, variables and, you know, get a pretty decent demand plan as the system kind of learns, you know, what's selling, what's not selling and associate, you know, what that forecast should look like. So we use it for demand planning, especially around our core product, um, which is our, our iconic classic clog. And so, you know, we have some core colors there um, that it can predict, but also then you can put some variables with that and predict, you know, eventually as it gets smarter, um, more and more of your revenue base. So we use it um, for forecasting and demand planning. I would say definitely in early stages of implementing, but um, it's been it's been fascinating so far. Uh, Christian, you want do you have an example? So I have several, but I'll try and pick the one that hasn't been covered so far. Uh, so we, uh, for example, on the revenue dilution, use forecasting models, the potential disputes. Uh, that might come up and might lead to uh, dilution in the revenue is an area that ultimately has an impact on profitability as well as various parameters that can determine potential events or, or, or you know, scenarios in which revenue will be disputed. And Chris, how does this play out for a, a future revenue dilution model? Sure, I'll, and I'll give this one easy example. Uh, in one city, we own a professional sports team. We own the building they play in. We own the parking lot underneath. Uh, when you have a storied rival uh, where you have a 70-year history of playing uh, big games uh, and it's a Saturday night, the price for that ticket maybe in dynamic pricing is higher. The price to park is higher. and The price of the food we serve during the game, it's higher too. So there's the, it just dynamic pricing that follows with demand. All right, now I'm interested. What do you? Which team do you guys own? Uh, the Boston Bruins. Oh, I, I grew up going to the Garden. I love the Garden. 
Oh, you oh. Well, yeah. we, we, appreciate, we appreciate, we appreciate your business. <laughs> um, so we've been, another question that the audience is interested in, I think also it's right on point is we talked briefly about m a and how remote work sped it up. Um, what is it, um, as he, as CFO is looking at a world where like, it seems to be m a nut job time where everybody's buying everything all the time. Have you been, or at any price, frankly, have you all been challenged in this environment to get involved in M&A? And has that changed, have your role changed in M&A in the last couple of years? Um, anyone want to jump in? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll start. Uh, the, uh, the the technology industry is uh, is is on a very, um, it, it's, it's, uh, it can't get enough m a so semiconductors are under significant consolidation but as well uh in the kind of in the in the software as a service space you're seeing it you're seeing it uh move as well i think that this is uh, this is the new trend scale matters um the the ability for companies that have interesting products or innovative technologies to get to scale organically is hard so it becomes attractive for them to uh, to sell into uh, into a company that can help them accelerate that and and it becomes a very uh, uh, a logical combination on both sides so i think we're going to continue to see uh, continue to see m and i um in the in the chat box i saw someone was asking are you seeing deals take place at depressed valuations and i would say in tech quite the opposite it is uh, it is exorbitant valuations and it is very hard for anyone to get back to a uh, discounted cash flow model that can justify some of the prices that are being paid but um today's uh, today's merger math is really driven off of off of multiples and and the value creation that's coming off of that versus more traditional valuation methodologies and i think i saw you uh, say so you want to jump in? Um, I can. Um, I think that was a good answer. I think it's it's a little different for consumer products, but also still a lot of M&A. I think in the footwear space, particularly, we've had um, we have a lot of footwear IPOs, which is something we haven't seen as much because valuations are so high. Um, it's making M&A a little bit unrealistic. But I'm curious because I thought that was a really interesting answer about I think it's difficult as a CFO if you're trying to do a traditional valuation model. And the cash flow, discounted cash flow, has no you know bearing on what you're going to pay. So I'm curious how other people are, how my other colleagues here are thinking about that, or um, and how you kind of work through that. Yeah, because I always think of the CFO as like the sensible one, you know, the one who sort of says, "Hey guys, I know it's a wonderful company, but." And do you have you guys found yourselves having you know having to swim against the tide on this stuff, or what do you do when the models don't actually match the prices? Right. Well, there there is that uh, there is that last column on your Excel spreadsheet, which is the perpetuity or the terminal value, and that usually ends up uh, uh, having a disproportionate uh, impact on uh, on it. But I think, and the the um, what, what we're seeing in tech is a lot more um, uh, all equity deals, and that allows you to trade uh, currency for currency. So that does help a great deal uh, versus uh, uh, other industries that are more traditional and looking for. Uh, for um, a, a cash-based deal, but I would say, in 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 uh, if if you're looking for a cash-based deal, it's hard to get better pricing uh, or better borrowing costs than we have today. So that's the other kind of the other offset to the uh, why M and A is just so hyperactive in general. Christian or Chris, does either of you want to jump in on the M and A question? Go ahead, Christian, and then Chris after. Yeah. Uh, so. Honestly, I, I agree with uh, Prashant. On tech side, uh, uh, the amount of money that has been poured in and some of the valuations amaze me. I know you talked about perpetuity of terminal value. I, I, I still wonder. But having said that, I think so. it's very different by industry. Uh, I've seen the transactions on the retail side uh, in a different dynamic, and I, I believe some of them had to go through significant model change overnight, and that led to uh, depressed valuations because of the readiness and things like that. Uh, on pharmaceutical side, I've seen some transactions which were not necessary. I mean, I would have expected pharmaceutical actually in this environment may have gained valuation, but not necessarily. Uh, and uh, also, I saw some consolidation and logistics uh, uh, in some of our clients. They tried to 
uh, merge or the private equity players try to bring multiple different formats of logistics companies to make one large company that is a more holistic provider. Those are some of the things we, we, we saw, to your point, scale becoming bigger uh, and uh, variation of the type of transactions that were happening depending upon the industry. You want to weigh in? Sure, thanks for that. Obviously not a public currency to trade, but uh, low cost of funds has made things extraordinarily pricey combined. And we try to balance what what is, uh, we think, uh, a value of opportunity with actual value realization. I think I'll be leading one of those discussions you referred to where the CFO does bring everyone back down to earth a little bit later this week but there's scarcity value of assets too in that quest for gaining appropriate size and scale. Let me jump in and remind the audience, we've got probably another 10 minutes. So if you have not yet sent your questions in, please do it because we want to hear from you. So far the questions have been great. Um, speaking of CFOs adding some real world value, one of the crucial things I think most people assume you guys are doing is making sure that there is a legitimate return on investment both for digital and for M&A, and um, in a world where pricing is slightly crazy and, and also hard hard to predict given the pan, how the pandemic is affecting business models, I'm interested on how do you provide that guidance on whether something whether you're getting proper return on investment for what and what, whether your CEO's ideas make any sense from a financial point of view. One of you guys want to jump in? Sure, <laughs> yeah, I, I think so. One of the biggest things I, I talked about agility at the start, and I think so variability in the cost structures is, is uh, very important. And so is the variability in your pricing models, at least for us, both of those aspects, uh, you know, moving uh, towards uh, a more variable cost structure and at the same time moving towards a more gain share based mechanism where you are bringing in, you're sharing the value and you're vested along with your customer to generate higher value so that there is more bigger pie available to share rather than trying to you know, uh, negotiate in the small pie. Uh, those are some of the areas uh, where I personally believe that uh, ROI can be improved despite higher valuations. And do you want to jump in? Yeah, just um, so I agree with that. I think, you know, moving away from m and just for a second and just talking about digital, uh, just ROIs in general and how we think about that, you know, it's interesting in the digital um, selling space because there are so many new kind of go to market models for, especially in a consumer company product and globally. And I think you don't necessarily, you may have um, a thought process of what the ROI is going to be, but you don't necessarily know upfront. So I think, even just in that um, you know, example, if you can do variable um, and you can do small test and learns and then measure after, because otherwise, you know, you you might like, for example, we just started doing, you know, TikTok in the last couple of years. TikTok didn't exist before. So like from a marketing standpoint, it was like, okay, well, what's you know, what's the ROI gonna be on this? But you know, you can spend, you can learn, you can test. And so I think that test, learn, and pivot is really important and if you're as a CFO holding them kind of accountable to like, okay, well, what was the expected result? What did we get? How do we think about this ROI in relation to other ROIs and then, you know, allocating spend based on that is important. It's difficult because it's not always clear up front, but I think doing small tests that don't risk the enterprise that allow you to actually potentially develop into really high ROI models are really important. Well, we, we have a, a question that I think in some ways makes a good wrap up for us, um, which is, um, you know, given we're talking about the changing role of the CFO post COVID, uh, one of our audience members is asking, you know, can, can we give some concrete examples on how behavior change uh, in management meetings, particularly, you know, involving the sort of CFO's responsibilities or your own personal behavior? Because of the pandemic and remote work, can each of you give one exam, one concrete example? Because I think that helps people. Uh, Chris, you didn't get to talk last time. You want to give us one? Sure. Um, you know, in our senior management uh, meetings, in particular, given the impact of the pandemic to our business, uh, if you will, uh, siloed thinking, uh, non. Uh, 
uh, non-enterprise thinking really fell away because we're, we're fighting for our lives, frankly, and it got people very focused and uh, they, you know, put on their best enterprise hat. A year later, we're in a much, in, in an incredibly good position uh, and our business is outperforming 2019 levels. So I think, you know, really uh, when the chips were down, uh, everybody's, everybody leaned in. So I, I would cite that. Uh, Prashant? I think one of the, um, uh, and maybe a, a contrarian view, one of, one of the biggest challenges I think that has come from this remote work environment is um, coaching and mentoring has really taken a dive. It is much harder to, um, I think uh, we are underestimating for people who are trying to build their career, much of what they learn is by observation and helping to get, you know, digestion of what just happened in an event. And in Zoom meetings, uh, when the meeting is over, the meeting's over and everyone's back uh, in their remote locations, you are missing this incredible uh, hallway interaction that happened where, you know, you were able to explain to somebody or they were able to ask a question about what just happened in there or why does that said there's a, there's so much soft stuff that is just not occurring uh, because we are uh, more comfortable working remote that I think for folks who are earlier in their career, it's much harder to build the soft skills um, and the expertise that's needed to become uh, to become good managers. Christian? So first of all, I 100% agree, Prashant, on the softer side. I think so that's a big piece of what I missed. But for me personally, Brooke, one of the biggest changes on the behavior side was I reduced significantly the formal agenda-based reviews with the team. And I increased significantly informal, non-agenda-based communication with the teams, with the customers, uh, with, with whoever I work with. Uh, that was uh, actually to make up for that softer touch that was needed. And also with the stress that was being caused with the multiple changes, continuing with those traditional format-based reviews was just adding one more task without much value. So we, I kind of put, pulled back on those a lot and significantly ramped up, just picking up the phone and, and catching up what's going on. Interesting, I wish my managers had done that. Um, and I think you haven't gotten a chance to weigh in on, uh, give us your example. Yeah, I have two things. One, I, I really love that point and I agree. Um, I started scheduling just 15 minutes, we use Teams, but you know, 15 minute video chats with each of my smaller group teams. Um, and it was no agenda. It was just like, calm, we can talk about, you know, your new dog, we can have, you know, coffee together, whatever. There's no agenda, but let's just try to recreate that hallway conversation and have some informal and being very intentional about communication. Because even though there was no agenda, it's like, no, we have to have it because I haven't seen you and, you know, or new people are joining and I don't know them. I think that's one. I think the second thing that I do enjoy a little bit is the great equalization of we're all at home. Um, we all have kids. We all have dogs. We all have you know, people vacuuming when we're on Zoom calls. And so it does bring a little bit of human touch um, and a little bit of equalization to all of us, um, which is really nice. I remember earlier on in my career, like if your child walked into your room, you know, if you were on an early conference call, that was like the end, a crying baby, right? And now it's like, I literally had a leadership team meeting at seven in the morning because we have uh, people overseas. You know, my daughter like came in and was just like sitting on my lap listening to me read financials. So that's not like, the ideal choice, but it was also became a little bit more acceptable of that integration between home and work, which which I really appreciate. So. Well, that, that's a really good example. I think um, we are coming to the end of our panel. I mean, I think what's been really interesting is we've gone from the really deeply geeky stuff to the human interest. And one thing that's really clear to me is that the, the CFO who is often put in a box as the super boring person in the corner who does the numbers is obviously you guys have had to cope with a much wider variety of issues and a much wider variety of challenges. And um, I guess quick round robin, do you like it better this way or would you rather have it you know, back, go back to your box? Uh, let's go down. Prashant, good or bad? Uh, I don't think we have a choice. Uh, I think that there, this is this is the new world, and um, 
we have uh, we we still have adaptations we have to make to optimize in this new environment. So um, uh, I would say that that there's m multiple aspects of it that I love. There are pieces of it that I think we still need to figure out how to how to address uh, some of the challenges that it's introducing. Chris. It, it's it's better, and it, uh, we need to just continue to refine croissants right on it. Kristen? Even if I had a choice, I wouldn't go back. It's intellectually more stimulating, more satisfying, and, and I agree with Prashant. There is, there is no choice anyways. And Anne? I agree, too. I love the engagement um, with the business and just the closer connection. So I, I think it's great, um, and we don't have choice, so... <laughs> Thank you guys for your honesty and your insights. I, you know, we can't see the audience clapping, but I'm sure they are. Um, we really appreciate you joining us. Thank you, audience, for listening and sending in a series of really great questions. Um, please do join us again. There are lots of really great FT Live video panels these days, and someday we'll have FT Live events. I, someday it'll really look like that. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Have a good day, everybody.